Hello everyone, this is Eva Nolik smith with Yoga You Online, and I'm very excited to be here today with author and yoga therapist, Doc Keller. So to begin, I have a question for you. What do you get when you cross a scientist's father with more than four decades of yoga studies? And the answer, of course, is you get Doc Keller. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad of you here in the beginning, yeah, right? Scient scientist mother, too. She was by oh, scientist. Oh, well, now oh, yeah. Really double double scientist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm saying that because I think your contribution to yoga has just been unparalleled in uniting these four decades of yoga studies that you have with in-depth study also of Western science of physiology, anatomy, and particularly knowledge of what it takes to keep our body healthy and functional over our lifetime and how yoga can help, which of course is one of the things we are focusing on today. We're focusing here today on the topic of forward head posture, text neck, and why this ep epidemic of posture issues is not just something you should ignore, but something you should really pay attention to. This is also um, a preview. Talk Doug is going to talk about some of the things he'll be covering in his upcoming course on Yoga You Online on exactly how we can use yo yoga to help counteract text neck forward head posture and of course, dowager's hump, which some of these issues can develop into over time if we're not careful. So um, Doc, welcome. We're so happy to have you join us. Thank you, glad to be here. Definitely so, said this is an issue that I'm dealing with too, having to do a lot of Zoom presentations. So yes. says, I'm, I'm calling it a Zoom neck in addition to being text neck because you're kind of looking into the camera. So yeah, it's right, an issue right. for all of us at this point. Yeah, I guess Zoom neck is a completely new new one. <laughs> Lean forward on the sits bones, <laughs> straighten through the side body. Um, Tadasana of sitting, right? Um, so anyway, diving in um, with the increasing use of smartphones, we really are seeing this epidemic of forward head posture and tick's neck. And I think we're just starting to realize that this isn't just unflattering. It, it can cause some long-term issues that really are quite undesirable. Um, do you wanna talk a little about that? Um, certainly I'm gonna go through a lot of the permutations in the, uh, in the presentation. I'll just mention for starters, I mean, you've already had a number of presentations on Yoga Yoga about the vagus nerve and the effect of the cranial nerves in connection with all the processes of the body. And uh, so far the presentations have been very much upon the, the psychological or emotional side of it, which is really important. But there's also a very strong physiological side because where these cranial nerves exit from the brainstem is at a small opening below the ear. And the position of the neck puts pressure upon these cranial nerves as well as circulation to the frontal brain. And so it has an effect upon the state of your nervous system, whether you're in a sympathetic state or parasympathetic state, it has an effect upon circulation of the front brain, which in subtle ways affects how your mind is functioning as far as where you put your energy. Uh, and in turn also has an effect upon breath, heartbeat, all of these other things. So uh, the neck position does have a direct effect upon the nervous system. Um, certainly it causes a lot of stresses in the body that we're going to talk about, uh, that cause muscular aches and pains, joint problems, even a loss of range of motion in the joints. There's what's called an arthrokinetic reflex, which the body has, where if the joints are not positioned properly or functioning properly, the reflex from the nervous system is to tighten up some muscles and shut down other muscles in an attempt to try to stabilize the joint. And that applies to neck joints as well. So when you experience problems of lack of range of motion in the shoulders, as well as the neck, uh, as well as aches and pains and stiffness and neck clicks and pops and that sort of thing, all of that is the body's response to the bad positioning of the neck and the muscles causing this 
to come about. So even some rotator cuff issues start with that sort of reflex before it's an actual rotator cuff problem. And that's just a few examples of a whole list of issues that come from this. We're also gonna look at the fact that what in general we're calling the forward head actually has a number of different kinds of manifestations. So it doesn't always look the same depending on what the rest of the body is doing. And there's also the problem of people overcorrecting by tucking their chin in and trying to fix their posture by that chin tuck. In fact, sometimes doctors tell you, tell you to stretch out the muscles by tucking your chin. That can be overdone to the point that that causes a whole other set of problems for the neck and upper back and shoulders. We're gonna devote more time to the forward head because it's more common, but we're also gonna recognize the consequences of overcorrecting. So we want to strike a happy medium in between the two where we start to come into a better, better alignment. Mm. And I, I think there is a um, sort of a natural progression. This isn't just like your text neck and that's it. You know, there's a progression, text neck, forward head posture, potentially hyperkyphosis over time, which also can turn into a full-fledged dowager's hump. And you mentioned the issues neck and shoulders, but once you get into the collapsed upper body, there is mm -hmm. a whole other range of issues that occur in terms of you know depressed breathing. And I think one of the things that was most striking to me about um, the research that's coming out, particularly on hyperkyphosis, it used to be that they would, um, you know, think that vertebral fractures were linked to osteoporosis, and now we there's research coming up that, sh that shows it actually um, it can be an issue. Vertebral fractures can follow from hyperkyphosis, uh, not just osteoporosis. And you know, then the whole collapse of the spine with the vertebral fractures that leads to Dowager's hump is sort of the end result of that whole cascade of changes. Yeah, yeah, and there's a whole galaxy of permutations of that because also uh, the head and the chest position affect the breathing, mm -hmm. which tend to reduce diaphragmatic breathing because the diaphragm is so compressed by the forward head that uh, people tend to become. Uh, first of all, chest breathers and also over breathers, which means it changes the relationship to carbon dioxide in the body. And on a whole piece of research from Leon Chaitel, who did a whole book about breathing pattern disorders, was pointing out how this sets up a vicious cycle in the blood chemistry such that as carbon dioxide levels drop in the blood from a oversensitivity to it, essentially through a series of factors, uh, it starts to leach calcium out of the bones. So our br very breathing patterns are connected to the weakening of the bones that lead to the additional problems of the fractures and the kind of uh, all of the problems associated with osteoporosis that you're talking about. So, yeah. so far as we affect the breath, we also affect the health of our bones. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. I, a friend of mine, uh, she's a physical therapist and she started working in, um, in our retirement home. And she said she had to stop working because it was like so depressing. Everyone was hunched over, you know, pretty much like 99% had this uh, hyperkyphosis. And I, I think it's striking particularly um, then if you think about like about 30% of the older population has um, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary yeah. disease. So there's this whole, Thing that starts with just this little innocent forward head posture and text neck, but a couple of decades down the road, um, it could create some serious problems in your body. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And I, I think if we then turn our attention to yoga, the contrast is, you know, how, you know, in Western medicine, the issue of forward head posture and hyperkyphosis tends to kind of fly a little bit under the radar. But in yoga, if we look back to the ancient yogis, it was completely different, right? It was like the spine, spinal alignments. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, first of all, on the, the, the basic medical, medical model, 
is to look for some form of tissue damage, whether from disease or trauma. And so uh, when there's a physiological problem, they look to make a diagnosis to find out what's wrong, what's damaged, what's gone wrong. And uh, that applies especially to acute pain, but not necessarily to the kind of chronic aches and pains that start to appear before there, there's tissue damage. And there's not necessarily a consideration of the factors leading to those aches and pains, which first of all, postural, having to do with the balance of muscles and especially the balance of the spine. And so the whole yoga tradition has been about the free unblocked flow of energy through the body, which is expressed in older Sanskrit language in terms of flow of prana or flow of consciousness, which sounds a little bit woo-woo to us, but when we start to connect, particularly what we understand of the fascia, the connective tissue of the body, with how the nervous system functions, including the lymphatic system, uh, what they were talking about in more uh, broad terms with terms like prana is very relatable as far as the systems that start to go wrong before discernible damage shows up because of problems in not just posture, but breath and connection with posture and an understanding of how much our emotional state impacts our posture and vice versa. Uh, all of these come together. Uh, again, the yogis described it in terms of a block of flow of prana, which often had to do as much with mental or emotional blocks or hangups as they did with physical blocks in the body or even blocks or obstructions in the breath. And they all kind of came together in the same galaxy of problems, which is a good way to look at it instead of trying to separate it out and say, well, this is a psychological problem. That's an emotional problem. That's a physical problem. And that's a problem of disease or damage or that sort of thing. They're all very much interrelated. And uh, the first step towards overcoming chronic pain is actually self-awareness. Uh, and that, and we experience from the forward head, often the pain that's coming from that is not obviously from the forward head. We may get that a little bit later, but once we become more self-aware of how we hold ourselves, carry ourselves, and the patterns that we drop into based upon what's going on inside, when we have that self-awareness, we can pull ourselves out of it. I mean, I'm even aware as a yoga teacher, walking around class, giving instructions when we were in that world, I would be think first of all, looking at the students and also thinking about what I wanted to say, I would get into this mental posture where I realized my head was down here a bit as I thought about it. And then I would catch myself in that posture and kind of come out of it because I could feel it in my body that I wasn't as connected when that happened. So these are, first of all, cues for self-awareness to catch yourself when you start to fall into these postures and what is the adjustment that you make both physically in the body, what simple tools can you make for readjustment and also what readjustment can you be aware of inside mentally and emotionally that allows you to move into a different space where you inhabit that upright posture instead of trying to put yourself into a posture. I mean, it's one thing, for instance, the chin tuckers are trying to force the body back into a proper posture and causing unnecessary pain because of it. Rather, we're looking for the kind of posture that invites us to inhabit that posture and be there. And then that becomes the most balanced state in which you derive the greatest benefits from being in that place. Recognizing we can always fall out of that state, but we're self-aware enough to know how to bring ourselves back into that balanced place. And so we're looking at basic cues for that and things to help us along the way. Mm. Yeah, it brings up a good point because I think anyone who has tried to straighten up, stand tall, uh, know that, you know, you correct one part of the body and then another part goes out, right? Um, excessively forcing your shoulders back, you end up with a exaggerated lumbar curve, which also is not good. Um, so I think it's a beautiful point you're making about starting with awareness. Um, but I think there's also like a whole element of reshaping the soft tissues. I mean, the yeah. fascia has kind of become more or less locked into a habitual way of, you know, carrying the body. So how, 
what's the principle there and how can yoga help us? Speaking about the neck specifically or just? Yeah, and also the slump forward posture. I mean, it's, you know, particularly, um, you know, forward head posture and the rounded shoulders, the shoulder blades begin to migrate away from each other and up the spine, right? So you have actual yeah. physical changes that get locked in the body. So what are the principles for how you start working with that? Um, I think to keep it simple, because now we're talking about the whole body and uh, the model that I'm gonna introduce for discussing the neck, understanding that we're looking like you're saying it more than simply what the head and the neck are doing or where they're positioned. Uh, Vladimir Yanda was a Czechoslovakian uh, body worker back in the 90s, introduced what he called the cross syndromes, both the lower cross mm -hmm. and the upper cross. And it gives us a sense of relationship between muscles, both front body and back body, and how they combine in different ways to produce different shapes. And it gives us a kind of body map to follow, to understand once we recognize our own tendency, our own pattern, which muscles are tight or held tight and what need to be released, and which muscles need to be activated or strengthened. And in saying activated or strengthened, it's not simply doing exercises to make them stronger, but in the postures that we fall into, some muscles simply get inhibited or shut off, or they become this dark zone where we're not even aware of them anymore because they're not functioning and we're feeling or experiencing tightness in other place, places of the body. So we have to bring awareness. So for instance, muscles at the back of the neck going into the shoulder blades to do exercises, to bring our awareness back to bringing the head in alignment with those other muscles to hold that upright posture, rather than simply trying to fix parts like drawing the shoulders back or drawing the chin back, which doesn't respect the whole matrix of what's going on. So the approach is going to be to present this kind of body map for the upper body. That's enough for us to cover in the two sessions and also get a little bit subtler sense of what the bandhas in yoga are about, what they're encouraging us to do in terms of our awareness, not only of physical position, but of the breath. And Jalandarabandha is a good example because in the practice of pranayama in yoga, we're accustomed to thinking Jalandarabandha is being, bringing the chin down to the sternal notch and lifting the chest up. That facilitates holding the breath in kumbhaka. It, it facilitates breath retention. So it has its purpose in pranayama. But the subtler sense of what's going on in Jalandarabandha is to be aware of what's happening with the alignment of the breath at the back of the throat. Because when people practice it, they basically take their head forward and down too much in an attempt to bring the chin to the chest, which is falling, in, falling into the very pattern that we're trying to overcome. Um, another way of expressing what you were saying at the beginning about the patterns that we're falling into as a culture is what a one body worker named Eric Dalton and others, including I think Ida Rolf, call our flexion addiction. We're ad addicted to being in flex postures, first of which is simply sitting in a chair where your hips are flexed. So you're sitting with hip flexion, and then the upper body tends to flex forward, and especially the neck flexes forward. So the, the more you're looking at your phone or your computer screen, the more your neck is in flexion. And then again, the body has that arthrokinetic reflex that I mentioned, where as it tries to stabilize the body in the position that it's used to being in, it remembers that position and then that becomes normal. And so like you're saying, what the tissues learn is over time, as far as the nervous system is concerned, this is normal now. And it's harder to bring ourselves out of it because it feels not normal to be in that, to, in that new place and also can be effortful at first. It is a moving target because, which means you can't put yourself in the perfect posture on day one and expect to be able to hold it. Or even if you attempt to, you'll be pretty sore on day two because the body's not used to trying to hold that position. So gradually you bring yourself into that place and all of the tissues accommodate and then start to remember what this better position is. And so the body learns from that, but it's good to get a map 
uh, of the body to begin with to understand where you're at. And that helps you understand where you're trying to get to, where you would like to get to, and what are the roads that you have to follow to get there, both in terms of stretching and releasing, if we want to call it stretching, and also activating or uh, basically strengthening, if we want to call it that. So that's the overall approach. And the idea of Jalandarabandha that will approach both invites us to think of the action a little bit differently and to use it as a guide. What's really happening that we'll look at in Jalandarabandha is with a slight nod of the head and a subtle engagement of muscles deep to the neck that stabilize the neck, it basically opens the throat to the ujjayi breath uh, when you're not doing it as a chin lock to retain the breath. So the more you, or the better you experience a soft, easeful ujjayi breath at the back of the throat, the better you're actually aligning the neck and the better you're actually practicing Jalandarabandha. Uh, which is useful to think of in active asana, uh, parallel to what's going on in pranayama. So that's kind of the yoga map that we're following. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, okay, we have a lot of great questions. So let's dive into to some of them. Uh, Jose, is, uh, Jose is asking if you could just repeat the title of the book by Leon Chaitov. On yes, Leon Chaitov is the author, C-H-A-I-T-O-W. Um, and basically on Amazon, look up, look up breathing pattern disorders because his first title was highly technical and they've been monkeying with the title since then. It's still a little bit lengthy, uh, but it's essentially breathing pattern disorders. And it's a book that's a collection of, of studies and essays by different researchers coming from a lot of different perspectives, including a whole chapter on yogic breathing techniques and studies that have been done surrounding that, as well as other movement disciplines and studies of overbreathing by doctors and chiropractors, osteopaths from different perspectives. So that's a really good resource to follow. With Leon Chido as uh, the editor of the book. Yeah. Cool. All right, and then uh, Patricia is, while we're at the references, Patricia is asking for references on uh, the vertebral fractures as a result of hyperkyphosis. And we can send the reference along when we send out the recording of this session to everyone. But basically, if you do a search on Google on PubMed, hyperkyphosis in San Bernardino study, uh, it should pop right up. Uh, so PubMed, uh, hyperkyphosis, St. Bedino study. Uh, but we'll send those references as well when we send the recording. Um, so let's- I noticed uh, Julie yeah. Meisters is asking about the multifidae. Um, yeah, and that's definitely the deepest muscles of the neck. They're gonna be key to alignment of the neck and also especially key to dealing with problems of slippage of vertebrae that happen in dowager's hump. The multifidus muscles are the deepest muscles of the neck that we need to strengthen along with traction to help realign the neck because it's basically their job to maintain the proper alignment of the vertebrae. So that's gonna be a very important part of it. And of course there are muscles on top of those that we'll be working with too, but it's that deep level that we're working with. And it also uh, establishes a very deep relationship between the tilt of the sacrum that establishes the curve of the lower back with the role of the multifidi and establishing the, the natural curve of the cervical spine. And the interesting thing is that those muscles stop basically at C2, which means not the last vertebrae, that the next last vertebrae, which allows the head the freedom to tilt up and down and even rotate to some degree freely on top of the spine without involving the rest of the spine. And that introduces one of the challenges for our working with the neck, which is that people tend to overactivate the muscles that tilt the head called the suboccipitals. And this interferes with our ability to work productively with the multifidi to get proper alignment in the neck. So we have to kind of like stabilize or uh, I don't want to say inhibit, but lessen the overuse of these suboccipitals so that we can work more productively with the neck. So yeah, that's gonna be a key part or a key part of it. And um, we got a bunch of questions that people send in to us via email. So let's take a couple of 
uh, questions there. Eve, she did not write her last name, but she says, Doc, your work has helped me personally and as a teacher. Um, she says, I, can you speak to how the thoracic spine ribs can affect forward neck position and the language demonstrations and experiential exercises that can help raise personal awareness of alignment to support the head? I find my students' awareness of the thoracic spine is often not there. How to not round the upper thoracic spine or arch the back ribs forward and overcorrect? How do you find your sweet spot of alignment? Yeah, it's a good question with a lot going on there. I, for, <laughs> first of all, the simple approach to it, uh, because the question is about awareness of what the thoracic spine is doing, particularly when it's rounding forward. I'll point out that people that overcorrect by pulling the shoulders back too strongly start to flatten the thoracic spine. And that introduces a whole new set of problems of pain that runs from the neck down into the shoulder blades from having an overly flat cervical spine and overly flat thoracic spine. So those people actually need to re uh, release that a little bit. But in general, it's hard to correct the thoracic spine directly. And like you're saying, if you do, all people end up doing is tilting the rib cage back rather than change, changing the shape of the spine. So there has to be a certain level of resistance from the abdominals or abdominal, abdominal engagement that holds the ribs to some degree. This is transverse abdominals and obliques. And then holding that firmness to start to work more with the action of the shoulder blades working against the back in a way that starts to lift and open the front chest and readjust the shoulders. Now, the position of the shoulders that's most useful is more to have the arms up, whether the hands are behind the head or a little bit further overhead, what I call the diamond arms with the arms like this, because what it does is it upwardly rotates the shoulder blades and allows us to use the muscles of the middle part of the back to draw the shoulder blades towards the spine, as opposed to having the arms at the sides where when people have forward shoulders and rounded back, they try to pull the shoulders back and perhaps pull the head back, but they're tightening up the muscles up around the uh, C7 or the upper part of the shoulder blades going into the neck that actually encourages a tightening of the neck and pulls the head down rather than allowing the neck to release. And so instead of working with the arms at the sides, or even when the arms are out the sides like warrior two, I like to have the arms a little bit higher instead of parallel to the floor, because this allows you to both upwardly rotate the shoulder blades slightly, because when people's shoulders slump forward, the shoulder blades rotate downwards and get stuck. So we need to turn them up a little bit and then draw them in towards the spine a bit more to diagonal like this instead of straight like that. That helps to open up the front chest, helps to realign the thoracic spine and the tactile feedback that you get, especially when you have your hands behind your head is you're both able to create a little bit of traction so you're not tightening the neck or pulling the head down in the spine. Plus you're introducing a little bit of isometric resistance that makes the muscles stronger such that when you release the connect correction, the head wants to stay in that position because now those muscles are firing and activated. And of course, if they cease firing, then the head goes forward and you can go back to that kind of readjustment. So a simple answer to your question along with maintaining some abdominal tone when we're working with the whole body is to work with the shoulders in conjunction with the neck in some particular arm positions that are pretty accessible to people and work pretty well. And that introduces variations to poses that you can practice that help to open the upper chest better in the poses than people often do. I'm thinking primarily of standing poses here, but of course it applies to other poses as well. Yeah. Here's an interesting um, question from Mireille, um, who is um, discussing this trend of completely avoiding flexion, particularly for people with osteoporosis. So she says, could you please address more specifically issues for people with osteoporosis? Some instructors ask 
not to drop the head in cat pose in a cat cow flow, uh, but the neck is the extension of the spine. So there is like a tendency to go like completely the other directions that we don't just need to carry ourselves more upright. We really, particularly if you have osteoporosis, you should avoid any kind of flexion. Um, so um, cat yeah. cow osteoporosis, what's your thoughts here? Um, it's a delicate matter because we are dealing with the delicacy of the bones for people and, and there's a tendency to overdo and create unnecessary muscular tension in an attempt to self-correct. So we have to keep that in mind. That said, it's kind of hard to tell people to stop flexing because you can't exist without flexing. I mean, most of what we do is flexion sitting in a chair. Uh, they're certainly advising against over flexing, which in particular means over rounding of the upper back. And with that rounding of the upper back, the head goes forward and it creates a lot of tension at the base of the skull and the suboccipitals, which just tends to, since as the neck comes forward, you have to lift your head to see what you're doing. So you've already created that tension in the neck. We need to uh, certainly practice more with extension uh, which means, first of all, extension is going back towards an upright posture, or even towards a back bend. With osteoporosis, that ability is limited, but we can go in that direction. So we need to inhibit the muscles that tend to drag us down into that flex posture. Those muscles start at the base of the head, but also in the map that we'll look at, continue through the sternocleidomastoid, the big muscles at the side of the neck that we primarily use for turning the head, which also continue down into the abdominals, which tend to get short and tight with that flexed posture. So we need to get those muscles to release so they're not contracting and even start to lengthen as we find ways of strengthening the muscles of the back body to start to bring the spine towards a more upright posture towards extension. That having been said, then we need to maintain that and work a little bit more with strengthening the lower back. So the movement in flexion comes more from the tilt of the sacrum, the tilt of the pelvis, rather than the rounding of the spine. Because essentially for people in that position, especially with the osteoporosis, the lower back gets stuck or kind of frozen and doesn't really move. And all of the movement as far as bending forward comes from the spine and the person naturally falls into that habit. So we have to inhibit that habit to some degree and then start to work with strengthening the lower back to help to maintain that upright posture. And of course, that's a whole process. And the main focus of what we can do in this webinar is to look at how we inhibit these muscles that are dragging us down and how we activate the muscles that start to bring us more towards an upright position. And then if you're practicing poses that are involved, some degree of flexion, like even the cat cow movements. How do you maintain something of that extension so you don't simply collapse into the old habit of simply dropping into the very flexion that's causing problems for the body to begin with? Yeah. I think uh, one of the aspects of improving posture is also actual extension, right? Where you sort of like pull yourself up by the hair and lengthen through the side body, but it helps really kind of release a lot of those posture imbalances. So yeah. we're getting a lot of people asking for like working with senior citizens, one beneficial asana, best instruction to use to start straightening the posture. So let's say 60 year old woman, Tadasana, which cueing would you use to help start building posture awareness? Standing in Tadasana? Standing in uh, usual problems. Yeah, I was thinking that the question was going to be more about chair yoga, which we can touch upon too. Uh, for people that are in chair yoga, the back of the chair with some padding provides some stabilization for the upper back so that you can start to work with the neck. Uh, but again, simplest idea, I'll start with an image and I'll actually, let me check one thing here. I don't have that image there, so I'll just suggest it to you. Um, even standing in Tadasana, this could be your like lazy man posture. 
where the two actions we're trying to promote with the neck are first of all, when the head is forward, we need to get the muscles that create extension to start to draw the head upright in line with the spine without necessarily the ribs popping forward as we've been saying. So if I take my hands behind my head, index finger across the base of the skull, and I'll give a little pull up with the hands, but I'll take the head back into the hands while keeping engagement of the abdominals. And you can think of the hands at the back of the head as being like a soft little balloon at the base of the head. So if you do it in a very soft way in the beginning, let your head rest back against the balloon, feeling the hand is like a balloon. And then imagine the balloon starting to float upwards. And that's where I introduce a little traction with the hands drawing up that creates a subtle bow to the head that draws the back of the top of the throat back and up. So rather than trying to get the head all the way back on top of the spine, let the head rest back against the balloon. Notice my elbows are slightly forward. And with the hands, let the balloon float upwards until you feel your head kind of uh, release and float on top of the spine. So there's, when the hands are behind the head, there's a sense of tone in the shoulder blades, openness to the chest, freedom to the neck, so that when you release the hands down into the Tadasana, there's that sense that the head is floating on top of the spine instead of getting pulled down on the spine. Uh, again, that can be practiced in Tadasana. There are variations on standing poses where I use that. That can certainly be practiced by people sitting in a chair if they put a bolster on the back of the chair and make that just a little bit of a back bend going back against that resistance. That's working with the back of the neck with different variations on that. What you were mentioning earlier about the lengthening through the crown of the head is actually a very deep muscle at the front of the neck. It's called a deep neck flexor. And this muscle will be illustrated in the workshop. We use it to bow the head forward. So we use it for neck flexion. But also when we activate the muscles at the back of the neck, we don't allow our head to go forward and use that image of lengthening up through the crown of the head. It's actually the deep neck flexors at the front of the spine, which are contracting to create that lengthening upwards. And so those muscles also need to be isometrically uh, strengthened. And that's where we need to be very delicate, but I also use a bit of resistance at the forehead, bowing the head forward in such a way that it doesn't so much tighten the sternocleidomastoids at the side of the neck. If you do it too hard, these muscles bulge. If you do it with a tiny little bow and then lift up into a little bit of an extension, it feels like you're nodding your head against resistance. That's the deep neck flexors, which will help to hold the spine upright from the front. When the head is forward, and especially when it drops into a curve, all those muscles get weakened and overstretched, as well as the muscles around the shoulder blades. And then from the neck to sternocleidomastoid, all of that just starts to drag us down. So we're simultaneously strengthening the muscles at the back in the shoulder blades and deep in the neck at the front. So there are a couple of basic isometric exercises that go from isometric to eccentric, which means we activate the muscle and then get the muscle to lengthen while it's activated. And then that helps to support the realigning of the body and the ability of the body to hold that realignment and to start to experience that as the natural posture where we're supposed to be. So we catch ourselves when we move out of it. And I think the advantage of asana practice is, I mean, it's one thing to show you the exercise here and to try it a couple of times and might say, well, it's okay, that's interesting. That seems to help a little bit. But when you take it into a series of postures, like a little yoga practice, could be just standing poses for people that can't come to the floor. And you start to practice the same actions in different kinds of poses. Then it starts to imprint upon you that this alignment of the head of the neck uh, is the center of the pose and you're better able to hold it. One little exercise doesn't teach you a lot. Performing the same exercise in a lot of different contexts, that's where it really starts to get written into the body in a way that the body remembers and is able to hold. 
Yeah, that's beautiful. And that, of course, brings us to the important topic of the course that you will be teaching shortly on Yoga You Online on reversing forward head posture using yoga. So you made a number of references, uh, but as we close here, could you just give us a brief overview of what you will be covering and how the course is uh, built up in terms of the different sections? Yeah, I can. I'll, I'm actually going to uh, share the screen for a moment, just to give you a little taste. This is also what's you guys are putting out of some sample slides. And so it allows me to give a short recap of what we're doing. Like I said, we're setting out a basic body map for understanding um, the forces behind the forward head. And this is that kind of upper cross that I was talking about that came from Vladimir Yanda, where we can identify the muscles that are tight, recall them facilitated or shortened, as opposed to the ones that are weak or inhibited. On the right, you see the deep neck flexors I was just talking about. On the left, you see the suboccipitals, which tighten up, which also connect the side of the neck to the shoulder blades. So when the head goes forward, it tends to pull the shoulder blades up the back. And as the shoulder blades right up the back, that tends to be what accentuates that kyphotic or that rounded posture, which is why I focus on getting the shoulder blades to release down the back and strengthen while releasing the neck. Then there are other muscles involved, certainly on the lower right-hand side, sternocleidomastoid that I mentioned, as well as we'll get into the involvement of the muscles of the upper back that you see on the left, the serratus muscles, rhomboids, and especially trapezius. And I'm showing on the bottom, there are actually different forms of the forward head. On the lower left-hand side is the more familiar old posture where the head is forward and the rib cage is tilted around it forward. Another version is where the rib cage is tilted back like the younger woman, younger woman on the right. Uh, her head doesn't seem to be so forward. It seems to be in line with the body, but that's only because the rib cage is tilted back so much the head goes forward in relation to it, shift to it. If you were to correct the rib cage, you'd realize she's actually looking down instead of looking forward. So this gives a map for the kinds of muscles that we're working with. As I mentioned, and we'll spend less time on this, the reverse pattern can be the case with the chin tucker, who basically tends to tighten the muscles that are weak in the forward head person and weaken the muscles that are tight in the forward head person. So it's kind of like the opposite side, but many of the principles that we're gonna work with are gonna be helpful uh, in their own way for working with people with a flat neck. And again, how people align their upper body makes a big impact, whether you've got a very flat thoracic spine like the woman on the left and a flat cervical spine, or the rib cage tilts backwards a bit like the woman on the right. And at the same time, she's tucking her chin in which flattens the neck in a way that's different from the forward head person. And we'll go into the dynamics of the dowager's hump, where with the combination of the pull of the muscles at the base of the head and the pull of the sternocleidomastoid muscles, as well as deeper ones like the scalene shown here, that creates a double whammy that both pulls the head forward and starts to cause the vertebrae to slip down just above C7. And as they slip down, they get stuck there or fixated, which means if you just try to take the head back into alignment, you run into that misalignment of the bones that makes it pretty much impossible to make a correction until you introduce a balance of both traction and extension, usually practicing a little bit of extension first and then some traction. And that's when the multifidus muscles basically do their magic of pulling the bones back into place and reducing that dowager's hump. And I've had teachers who uh, did the exercises with their students and got some immediate results for uh, reducing that prominence of C7. Part of the hump is also a buildup of tissue on top of those bones. We'll get into those dynamics and how to work with it. Simply uh, this, as you can see, mentions the effect upon the shoulder blades the pain problems that come up in the shoulder blades. We'll go through details about how to practice these uh, adjustments of both traction and extension. First, as a simple exercise, 
but then seeing how that can be incorporated into poses so it gets more deeply ingrained in our system. Uh, and this is just showing from another perspective, the same kind of adjustment, combining the action of the arm with the neck and gets into what I'm calling, or what I'm saying is a more nuanced interpretation of Jalandurabandha. And for those that are not as accustomed to the Sanskrit, I also speak of it as the swan's neck, where if you think of like the swan in the upper corner, when the swan wants to open its chest and open its feathers, it does this little bow to the neck that allows it to open fully. And then once the body is opened up, the neck becomes straight once again. Swans have very good straight neck alignment, but it's that curving action that allows a readjustment. So Jalandara Bandha in yoga is very much like that. And here is just mentioning, I'll have to go into this in a little bit more careful detail as far as this isometric action for the front body, but I actually have a couple of animations here that illustrate, first of all, uh, longus coli are the deep neck flexors that create that bowing. And when they're strong, and if you give uh, some resistance, not allowing the head to go forward, it creates what's called axial extension, which means you start to get taller through the crown of the head and the neck aligns itself with the rest of the spine. So strengthening that muscle is gonna be part of the process. The other one is a subtler one, longus capitis, which is part of those neck flexors, but it applies to the first couple vertebrae and essentially creates that little tiny nod to the head that stabilizes the front of the spine and opens up the back of the throat to the breath. It's that small action, that little nod supported by the other long muscles at the front of the neck that's the essence of what's happening internally in Jalandarabandha, opening up the space of the breath for regular ujjayi breath, but also helping to align the neck. And then there will be applications in poses, again, where it becomes more imprinted upon the body. And we'll talk about some other features that come up with the neck. The one I'll mention here is called the thoracic outlet syndrome, which from the confabulation of muscles in the neck, the scalenes, along with the collarbone and pectoralis minor, all of which are connected together, can put pressure on circulation and nerves, uh, both in a collapsed posture during the day, if somebody's working at the desk or while sleeping at night, that gives rise to symptoms of numbness in the first three fingers, running up through the forearm to the bicep or into the side of the neck. Neck alignment has a huge impact upon the syndrome Often people experience these symptoms and they worry that there's something wrong with their neck that they get, need to get surgery for when it's actually a realignment of the neck and a release of the muscles and opening up space underneath the collarbone is enough to address that problem. So that's just kind of an idea of some of the topics that we'll touch upon. The slides will be more extensive. And of course, it's gonna be a practice video to go along with it too. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Doug. We could keep you here all afternoon, but I know that you are preparing for the course, which starts this coming Thursday. And yeah. uh, we'll have two lecture sessions and then the practice. And as you can all tell, um, this is a signature Doug Keller course. You need uh, at least a week to digest every session. Uh, it's so pack full of great advice and insights. So Doug, thank you so thank much you. for joining us for this I, talk. And I see from the questions, I hope you let people know it is recorded so they can view the uh, yes. yeah. webinar so whenever they like. Both this talk is recorded. We'll send a link to you um, either by the end of today or, or first thing tomorrow. You'll also get a link to learn more about the course um, that Doug is teaching. And that course is recorded. So you can join us live Thursday night and I think it's Monday night, right? Um, and then um, it's also this Thursday and then it's next Wednesday, I believe. Okay, let's see here. Da, 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 da. I don't have my calendar. Um, Yes, th Thursday and then Wednesday. So Thursday, April 18th and 
Wednesday, April 14th is um, the two live sessions with Doug and then the yoga practice that goes with the course will be uploaded separately in your portal. So Doc, uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, really great, great gratitude to you for all the amazing work you're doing, integrating yoga with uh, Western science. And I would be bold enough to say helping Western science to make one step forward by this marrying of, of the ancient knowledge and wisdom of yoga. So right. thank you so much. Thank and everyone, much. thank you so much for joining us. And uh, keep an eye on your email for the link to the recording. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.